Make sure you're right. <laughs> All right, student football. <laughs> Y'all remember this? Yes. Sam Bradford, Lindland's head. He, 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 he didn't know where he was at. He was a goofy. Worth it. <laughs> What'd you say? No, worth it. Yeah, exactly. So worth it. And for you OSU fans. Sorry. Yeah. And it fell off. Will fell off. For sure. This is kind of funny how we're trying to bring All right, so these are all board questions right here. What's, what's, what are they called? Here, what's that one? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. What is it? What is that? Associated with what? Okay. Facial trauma. Again, talk about document. Okay. No urea. No tempanum. No battle signs. No battle forwards. Those are just good habits to get into. Okay? When you're documenting pertinent negatives. Right? You know about pertinent negatives, right? Okay. Getting out of patients, get to the trauma center. Um, air transport is crazy. You know, we've had like five crashes in the last seven years. And it's crazy. You wouldn't believe the crap you get called from transport people. I had a call a month or so ago. We had a call from Airbag. Have this patient. It's a scene flight. They had surgery at your hospital. It's spine surgery. So they're in a car wreck. After the surgery? No. Like, what do you mean seam flight? So it ends up, she had back surgery, bent down in her, bent down in her bathroom, a little leak, fluid leak, we stopped, she had a CSF leak. And she may have. They drove to a local fire EMS station in Tishomingo, and they paid an $85 a year membership to Airbag, and they wanted to be flown from Tishomingo to Oklahoma City. And it's just like, this is not emergent. It doesn't need to be flown. Drive them to the nearest hospital. They feel she has an issue. They want to transfer her. We're happy to take her. This is not meet criteria. But I'll call you back. I'll talk to the surgeon. He's like, absolutely no surgeon. Absolutely not. They can go home. They can go to the doctor. I mean, whatever. They can go get money. Kind of whatever. So in the middle, I get a call back and everybody. I was like, these people know they don't meet criteria that they make to pay a lot of them. The next thing you know, he calls back. They're pissed off. They fly from Tishomingo to Norman. Norman discharges them home. They're getting a $50,000 bill. Okay? $50,000 now to fly helicopters. We fly people around for stupid crap. People are dispatching on helicopters. They pay this $85 a year on your stuff. It's silly. I mean, there's no reason to put patients and these crew. These crew make like $19 an hour. Okay? They don't get paid crap because it's cool, it's fun. And people don't pay them more because the minute they say, I want to do money, a million other people get money to do the job. So it's crazy for these people's lives in the line to move around and fly these uninjured patients. They don't meet criteria for air. There's a, a rule within 60 mile diameter. Anything within 60 miles is faster to go by ground ambulance. Okay? Unless, it's a, unless it's a big car wreck and there's going to be a little, it's long extrication time, those type of things. But again, it's, it's crazy. We fly too many people. So people get here by ambulance, by ground. This is awesome. That's actually, my wife was taking that picture on my motorcycle. We were driving out of Western one day. Isn't that awesome? I'm on Western? Yeah, yeah, like 10th and Western. People come in off the street, you know, kind of like thriller, they kind of come kind of coming through, okay? Head injuries can sometimes look awful, okay? Because it's bleeding, okay? You hit the head of the beer bottle or fall and hit your hand. You can bleed tremendously for understanding. <coughs> Crazy. Okay? This guy and his son were driving to Bass Pro, got hit by a drunk driver at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's his brain herniating out of his skull. Okay? Pretty obvious to see this guy has a head injury, right? Frontal scalp hematoma, right? Exactly. Bump. <laughs> okay? Did any of y'all watch the West Virginia game? Did y'all see that guy with the head injury going crazy and wanted to get back in? Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So, mechanism is important. 
Okay? This is a gunshot wound to the head. Okay? The transperineal gunshot wound. See the blood going across the midline there? Oftentimes people try to kill themselves. They do this. Okay? They're depressed. Okay? And what they do is they shoot the side of the face off and now just figure for the rest of their life now they're really depressed in their life. Okay? Great. You would not believe I took, I took care of this lady who cut my hair growing up for four days right when it was her. She had, a, she had a haircut place and it was her first name. I remember her last name. When people shoot themselves in the face, it's so swollen that they'll just, I didn't, I didn't put it four days. I wrote, oh gosh, I just cut my hair. Okay, penetrating trauma, you pull it out? No. <laughs> this image is called a scout. See those lines going through it? <coughs> if on a CAT scan, they kind of line up where their scanner is in the scan and they can tilt and turn, make sure they include everything they want in the scan. They don't want to get all the soft tissue stuff here they don't need. That's kind of pulled down and kind of narrow where they're going to scan. Okay? You can see, you can see kind of, so in a CT scan of the brain, you kind of get right below the orbits back to the base of the skull. So when you do a CT scan, so if you have somebody that has superorbital stuff and you worry about maybe having a fracture there, you can get that on a CT scan of the face, of the brain, excuse me, without having to do a CT scan of the face. But if they have lower stuff, you need to CT the face. But you know, lots of times if somebody has a little bit of orbital stuff, I'll have them go a little low and CT the face where you don't have to do a whole facial bone. That's okay. a void where that needs to be. <coughs> Choose the six out is called what? Anybody known the last time they were seen? Some people are ejected out in the ground in a ditch for two, three hours. How long are they down? Okay. They're trying to get as much history as you can. Sometimes you can't get it initially from paramedics. Sometimes it's not until family gets there later, sorting things out, but you need to find as much as you can. Okay. This guy was wearing a helmet, so motorcycle stuff, they're wearing a helmet, wearing pads. Okay. Coup contra coup, that's a board question. Right? You understand the coup contra coup concept? Mm -hmm. okay. Until I started working at the trauma center, I never in my life imagined how devastating brain injuries can be. I grew up in a small town riding four wheelers in the river. You always had a friend that broke an arm and broke a leg. But, you know, you would not believe how many people have spinal cord injuries that are killed and that have severe brain injuries. Okay? We have nothing in this state for traumatic brain injuries. It's really kind of awful. But the, the rehabs we have are really not very good, to be honest, for traumatic brain injuries. And what sucks is, if you don't have insurance, like we keep people on our service until they got good enough to go home and get outpatient care that the OU Medical Center would provide. Okay? There were people that I, that I took care of every day for six to nine months. I've spot four patients I took care of for a year. Okay? Every day. So, it's awful. I have a dear, a dear one of my good friend, my back wife called me today. He was, it was kind of a sad thing. Went off the road down in Goldsby. Somebody called 911. Saw a vehicle go off the road. A trooper pulled up, saw a broken down semi, and thought it was the vehicle, and canceled the 911 call. His vehicle went underneath the fence into an IRV park, and his car was crashed back behind a bunch of RVs on the other side. Wife had to go down and call, had to file a missing persons report. Uh, they didn't clue in that there was a night canceled 911 in that same area. Uh, they pinged his phone and found him. He was down for six hours before they found him. Had a bad hypoxic brain injury, not so brain injury, brain bleed. You know. He's blind, can't see, you might look at one of those from high school. Uh, and so it's pretty, pretty awful. He actually was fortunate enough that he went to Craig Hospital in Denver for a year and uh, went to Dallas, the place called Pate, for another eight months. And, you know, just imagine having a spouse who can't see, who doesn't know your name, and 
just full care. It's pretty, pretty sad. Luckily, they have funds. But, but traumatic brain injuries are awful. And USA deaths. Uh, for traumatic brain injuries, Cindy said they exceed the total of war dead from all U.S. battles. Yearly, 5,000 new cases of seizure disorders occur from result of traumatic brain injuries. Traumatic brain injuries leave up to 90,000 victims permanently disabled. Um, and it's the fourth million cause of death. Okay. Uh, total. And then the leading cause of death in ages 1 to 44. Okay. Terms that we use, kind of, you know, that kind of use about traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is the kind of catch term now. Uh, obviously, concussion and closed head injury, some other terms. Um, concussions and closed injuries are essentially kind of concussions. Traumatic brain injury severity can be severe to a minor concussion. So it's just kind of a traumatic brain injury is kind of a catch all term. 50% of all trauma deaths are secondary traumatic brain injury. 35% of those are caused by gunshot wounds. Obviously, the majority of these are mild injuries. So, part of the concept we talked about is not all neurological damage occurs immediately from the, from the point of impact from the primary injury, but often it evolves over time. Okay, the secondary injury. So, say this patient fell, fell 10 feet off their balcony and suffered an injury. But as a result of laying there and not breathing, it suffered an hypoxic pain injury, so secondary injury. So that's why it's important to know sometimes these people, you know, when they're when they're when they're injured, the last time they were seen, caught a stroke. When's the last time they were normal? When's the last time they were seen? Trying to pinpoint the time or how long they've been down or how long they were possibly laying in the ditch after they were ejected from the car. So primary injury talked about is irreversible injury, the result of the injury, prevent the event. Of secondary is preventing ischemia and hypoxia is the goal. Okay. So the critical first link is obviously recognizing uh, they have a traumatic brain injury. Okay, the big things by the committee of, of trauma, uh, tactical combat care is obviously their big two: preventing hypotension and hypoxia. Okay, for hypoxic hypotension, you get ischemic, hypoxic, and oxic brain injury. Okay, if you're not perfusing your brain, it's ischemic, worsening damage. So pre-hospital stuff, obviously. You know, ABCs or CAB now, it's now what's going to oxygen, IVs, C spine precautions. Okay? C spine precautions means what? Put them in a collar. Okay? You know, one of the things that's been big, that's kind of trended and gone away, is, is, is total immobilization of the spine, where spine work has kind of gone by the wayside unless you suspect a spinal cord injury or a specific spine complaint. Okay? Before they put people in the spine boards and they're uncomfortable. With, Awful, and they really don't prevent much of anything unless you suspect somebody has a thoracic or lumbar spine fracture. They're really not using spine boards much any longer. Okay, and that's where your thoracic and lumbar spine. C spine precautions is a C collar. T and L thoracic and lumbar spine precautions is laying flat. So if you're in the hospital, T and L spine precautions is laying flat. Okay, C spine precautions is a collar. Can you clear somebody from cervical or thoracic or lumbar spine precautions? If they have a brain bleed and have a brain injury or confused? No. Can you clear somebody from cervical or thoracic or lumbar spine precautions if they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol? No. no. <coughs> pupil size and light reflex. Okay? How would you document pupil size and light reflex? <coughs> light combination. And pupil size is the most common, what's, what's kind of the normal pupil size? Some people are different, some people are. But what would you say is the average of uh, three? So we talked about, again, definition of hypertension. Okay? It's just like blood pressure less than 90. Epoxy is going to that less than 90%. It's kind of a pre-hospital algorithm for traumatic brain injuries. Obviously, like anything else in a trauma patient or whatever it is, you want to know what your resources are, okay? Last thing you want to do is send your patient with a brain injury or traumatic brain injury or big trauma to a hospital that doesn't have trauma or doesn't have a CAT scanner or doesn't have neurosurgery, okay? The whole goal of our trauma system is to get these patients to the right place with the appropriate resources in the most efficient time. That's, that's the whole goal of having a trauma system, trying to get the patient, the patient to the right place that can care for them, okay? So obviously these patients with, you know, a low GCS, you know, kind of three to thirteen goes to a trauma center. Obviously, people with three to four and these lower these lower GCS scores need to be intubated. Okay. 
So when you walk up and see a patient with asymmetric or blown pupils, pretty pretty good to assume that they have a brain injury, right? Okay. If you get a phone call from EMS, they're in code, you're saying they're bringing a patient, and they say they have a patient with a GCS of two, are you very confident in their skills or ability to evaluate the patient appropriately? Mm -hmm. Why not? The lowest score you can get is a three, okay? All right? Sometimes you get these, you get these calls, and it, it's like, in trauma, you, 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 you'll deal with, with over triage all day long, okay? That's okay. Under triage is what you don't want, okay? These people that, that come in and have no idea what they're dealing with, a gagger, and these people are dying in front of your eyes because they rush around thinking they weren't hurt. But you get, we get these skin codes that, you know, 24-year-old male, brain matter coming out of his ears or out of his head, smashed between brick wall and car, and you get there and he's got a scalp lash. Okay? No, no, no. You get these people at auto pedestrian, unresponsive. You get there, they're unresponsive to English. Okay? You speak Spanish very well. Okay? You know? This guy, by the time he's at the fair, he was walking around, heard this big gong, you know, like a gunshot, goes down, his foot is bleeding. You know, the firemen, EMS, they wrap him up and they rush him to the trauma center and he gets there and he had the cubist ulcer that had ruptured in his foot and there's a mono, monogram that backfired. So he didn't get shot. It's funny. I mean, you know. It's funny. So GCS, y'all know about the Glasgow Coma Score? Okay. So what the, the GCS is about, it's just a repetitive way to evaluate patient and assess their mental status. Okay? Um, we used to joke about the neurosurgery residents, they'd round it like 3 or 4 in the morning. Like if you woke me up at 4 in the morning, I'd be a GCS at 14 all day long. I'd be confused. It was kind of funny to joke about these brain patients who are evaluating their GCS at like 4 in the morning. It's kind of funny. So if you see like a, like a score of a 10T, you know what that means? 10T <laughs> means 2, they're intubated, okay? So they can't speak. So the verbal is, is, is why they, they don't get scores this way, okay? Y'all know these, I won't go through these. You know about the Monroe Pilot Kelly Doctrine? So essentially what happens is when you get a brain bleed initially, you can compensate for a while. You have a, a you have a definite amount of space in your brain, your calvary, you're not needing more space. What happens is your brain and everything can allow for a little time to bleed and expanding and do okay. Okay? But what happens as that mass expands, okay, you start to herniate and get your cranial pressure. Does that make sense? So you compensate for a little bit, and then it's uncompensated elevation of your intracranial pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals your MAP, your mean arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure. The normal ICP is 10 to 15. You want to maintain an active cerebral perfusion pressure. It's more important than kind of tinkering and falling around your ICPs that are kind of nearly normal. You want to maintain a cerebral perfusion pressure greater than 70. Okay? And again, if we're not perfusing the brain, you get a toxic and toxic injury. Okay? So if your cerebral breathing pressure is less than 70, it's associated with poor outcome. Brain accounts for 2% of your total body weight. Brain still represents 15% of your resting cardiac output. Brain consumes 20% of the total amount of oxygen consumed. And it talks about your cerebral blood flow remains constant over a wide range of arterial pressures, 60 to 150. So when a mean arterial pressure rate 150, there's increased blood flow. So you kind of like the pressures up a little bit. So you know, having a little bit of a mild hypertension with these people is okay, but it'll increase their cerebral breathing pressure. Now, you don't want it 200, 0.90, but you, you, you're, you're okay with it being a little higher than, than 140, you'd be okay. And your cerebral blood flow ceases, okay, with the, with the mean arterial pressure less than 20. So, how do we image CAT scans? Okay, plain films, MRI, ultrasound. So, in trauma, in the acute setting of trauma, CT scan of the brain without contrast, okay? Plain films are really not utilized anymore. Uh, you know, plain films are really kind of utilized sometimes. Kind of some outlying areas that really don't really have CT scan, or some little kids don't have a on the skull fracture, but again, they a skull fracture. So plain films are really not used that often. Um, patients with a brain injury, you assume they have a seat, they have cervical spine injury. If they're confused, not to tell you their neck because it doesn't hurt. You scan their head, scan their neck. Okay, that makes sense. Or if you see a patient. You can't scan their head, you know, that has no neck, okay? You know, they're never going to be able to get adequate visualization. So it's just easier. If they're on the scanner and they're scanning their head and they have a brain injury or confused, just scan, just scan the cervical spine. MRI is not really used acutely 
in trauma patients, um, unless somebody has a spinal cord injury. But as far as a brain injury, they're not typically used acutely. Let's say you have this patient that comes in, they're rollover, they're rejected, and they're obviously altered and they're not waking up, and their mental status may not be breathing. But they have obviously an altered mental status, and off brain injury, and you get a CAT scan and it's normal. Sometimes these people have an hypoxic or anoxic brain injury or to suffer from diffuse axonal injury. It's kind of the shearing of the axons. That's really kind of the only time you really get an MRI of the brain on a acute trauma patient if you're worried about hypoxic or anoxic injury. But that's kind of often done after they're admitted to the ICU or to get the MRI later. The MRI studies take a long time. But, uh, but it, for trauma, essentially, it's a CT scan of the brain without contrast. Ultrasound isn't really used a lot in the brain acutely. Um, you can do some transcranial ultrasounds if you're worried about some kind of brain death. You got brain death exam, uh, oftentimes for cranial blood flow. Okay. Uh, this, but you know, again, acutely, you're not doing transcranial ultrasounds. Okay. It's more kind of a brain death exam. Make sense? Okay. Scalp lacerations. Talked about crazy blood loss. Uh, skull fractures. Okay. Um, you know, obviously skull fractures are, are, are a big deal uh, if they're depending on where they're out. You know, I don't know about you guys, when I was in school, I, read, I was never told anything about an inner and outer frontal table. So in frontal science, you have an inner and outer frontal table, and outer table is no big deal. You send those people home all day long after you talk to a neurosurgeon. But, you know, skull fractures are a big deal. Uh, so obviously you'll need a neurosurgeon to be evaluated. Baylor skull fracture we talked about. Um, one of the things I want you guys just, just to think about, if you ever have somebody that has a temporal bone fracture, that person at some point will need a dedicated CT scan of an internal auditory canal to rule out the injury to their incus and their stapes and their inner hearing apparatus, okay? It doesn't have to be done acutely, but at some point they're going to need to hear a lot of hearing issues secondary to a temporal bone fracture extends in the inner ear, okay? The exter ex external auditory canal is the EAC with that means. Okay. The skull fracture we talked about all our basal skull fracture signs. We've got rhinorrhea, otorrhea, battle signs, raccoon. CSF testing, yeah, I mean, nobody really does it. You can put on a piece of little filter paper that makes it in the halo or any sound. Um, you know, you start on antibiotics. Most people do with their skull fracture. Lots of times use ANSEF or RECEFIN, which are what class of antibiotics? Third generation. Sepsis <coughs> okay. Brain lesions, talk about diffuse brain lesions are kind of a mild concussion, cerebral concussion, diffuse axonal injury, focal lesions or epidural, subdurals, contusions, subarachnoid, and parenchymal others. So diffuse injuries are kind of acceleration, deceleration type injuries. Uh, torsional forces, most common cause of concussion. Okay, uh, a mild concussion is uh, typically kind of talk is about loss of consciousness. A classic cerebral concussion can be loss of consciousness or more severe kind of concussion. And diffuse axonal injury is severe. A diffuse injury says conscious preserve, but a noticeable degree of mild impaired neurological dysfunction. They often go and notice. They have confusion or disorientation, a slight integrated or retrograde amnesia. Diffuse or cerebral concussion. Loss of consciousness accompanied with some degree of amnesia and returns full consciousness in six hours of injury using no sequela. Uh, Suffered potion custom syndrome. And obviously, unless you've been in a cave studying for the last two years, you know, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is important. It's been in the news. Once you hear about those 12 players, probably repeated head injuries. The CTE is a big deal, We're talking about, you know, problems with dementia and some other memory issues and headaches and uh, early death. A few sexual injuries that we talked about, you know, these people are in a coma, you know, they're, they're not waking up, they have a normal head CT, um, so those are the people that have a bad outcome. Those are the patients off from the traumatic brain injuries that are kind of in a vegetative state for the rest of their life. There are a kajillion recommendations of how you deal and treat head injuries from different sports societies and neurological societies, and there's a bunch of different grading scores and scales. Um, that are all out there. You know, symptoms that we see from head injuries can be from very minor to severe. You know, lost conscious, altered consciousness, retrograde, amnesia, disoriented, mm -hmm. excessively sleepy, lethargic. You know, the word you hate to hear in the ED that you hear all the time is lethargic. 
I say my son's lethargy walk in and he's playing the tech or something like that. Have normal coordination, balance. Kind of funny, the testing, you know, if you're good enough to smoke, they're good enough to go home. If they're good enough to find their iPhone, oftentimes they're good enough to go home. Abnormal reaction times, concentration, comprehension. Sometimes I have blurred vision. The blurred vision and dizziness and headache are things you hear all the time uh, from patients when they have a concussion. Things that you can observe on the field, obviously, you know, vacant stare, lack of coordination, poor performance, wrong huddle, distracted, inappropriate behavior, slurred speech. And again, all these gradings are all very similar. This is Cantu, you know, a mild grade one, um, no loss of consciousness. Uh, grade two was LLC less than five minutes. Uh, severe, so LLC greater than, than five. And clerical return to activity is kind of sometimes they, they look at, but this is all kind of changed or older. I mean, pretty much now, for people getting concussions, they're out of play and they're in concussion <coughs> protocol, and the things have really kind of changed in the last three or four years. Here's the Colorado score. Very similar. Grade one is confusion, no amnesia, no LOC. Grade two is confusion, plus amnesia, no LOC. Grade three is positive LOC. American Academy of Neurology. Again, these are all just very similar. Post concussive syndrome is something you're going to see a lot. Um, you get these people that, hey, you know, had a head injury, you know, I'm still, I'm still having these headaches and just don't feel right, dizziness, fatigue. And these symptoms can, can sometimes last up to three months. Okay? And people have some more severe symptoms. Most oftentimes in you know, five to seven days, these people are pretty much back to normal. Follow-up care, obviously it's kind of, you know, whether you end up getting a CAT scan these patients or not, but you kind of get the same standard precautions the first 24 hours, a serial neurological event, you know, wake them up, you know, every four hours. If you haven't had it, so if the patient has a minor concussion, okay, and they have a normal, you end up getting a CAT scan, you can tell them wake them up every four or six hours, make sure they're okay. But oftentimes, if they have a CT, I won't wake them up. Okay, the patients that you really kind of wake up are the ones that you don't cast in. Okay, you tell families avoid sedating. You know, patients are okay in a car wreck and had a head injury. I want some pain pills. Like, no, I'm gonna be narcotics. Narcotics are dating. You have a head injury. Don't be narcotics. Okay, but avoid sedating medications. Um, you tell people. You know, I think I'll tell people if they if they start vomiting, intractable headache for people who don't cast in. Vomiting, intractable headache. Confusion, slur speech, ataxia, obviously worsening symptoms, but all means come back. Okay, and we'll get a CAT scan. We're trying to not CAT scan people if we don't have to. The last five or seven years, really decreased the CAT scan in patients based on lifetime radiation risk and exposure. There's no need to use a couple of CAT scans to give you cancer. But it's all about lifetime dose exposure. Okay? You know, a CAT scan is anywhere, I think, from I don't know, 1 to 10 millisieverts. I think that would measure it. You know, it's like 200 times more than a chest x ray. So, depending on the CT scan you get. Secondary impact syndrome. Now this don't be confused with post-concussive syndrome. Post-concussive <coughs> syndrome is you essentially have symptoms for up to, up to three months, sometimes. Secondary impact syndrome is something that's not really well understood. The reason why we tell people they can't participate in sports after they get a concussion is to allow their brain to heal. Kind of think of it like a bruise you can't really see on imaging. What happens if somebody has, has suffered a second head injury before the first one's had a chance to heal, the brain can lose its chance, its, its capacity to regulate pressure in the brain and the swell hernia. Okay? It's kind of crazy. So it's really important when you're talking to patients about why they can't play in sports till they're seen and cleared by their primary care physician or neurologist is because you don't want secondary impact syndrome. Because if you if you don't explain them why you don't want their kid to, to stay out or they don't hernia that kind of thing. We're going to let them play the next day, okay? This kid right here, you know, you know me, Dr. Lovelace? Yes. Me and Lovelace were walking working in a tough man contest in Bricktown, not Bricktown, the farmer's market. It's a 26-year-old kid who took, sent every, he knocked out every patient he fought. It's in the middle of the hospital, TKOs. And uh, he's fighting the tough man contest for 500 bucks. Had a baby on the way. And uh, he actually won the fight. He knocked this guy out. So after his fight, he's sitting me to Tammy on a stool, not all with us. He just falls and herniates, dies, for sad. 26 years old. He had had an ATV accident that he didn't disclose to us two days before the fight. His cousin told us the time. Of course, he denied any type of stuff on the pre-fight physicals every day. 
did not need to have recent injuries, but he ended up herniating and dying. It's pretty sad. Return to play, you know, again, these are all similar. I think, I think just kind of as a, just as a, as a generalization, I think you tell people no sports for at least five to seven days. They need to follow up their primary care physician to be cleared or a neurologist or specialist to be cleared to return to, to play. And again, these are, I think we're talking, we're talking concussions, not brain injuries, okay? And they have to be as, asymptomatic, okay, before they return to play. The key is, is kind of asymptomatic for a week. But we always tell them for a repeat evaluation, you know, five, three, three to seven days for primary care physician. Typically, before they return to play, they need to be asymptomatic for at least a week, okay? It's kind of the same with grade two. If you get a, a you know, third concussion, they talk about you know, terminating you know, participation in sports and just kind of things. Mild headache qualifies as a symptom. Correct. Any symptoms? Headache, dizziness, blurred vision. So asymptomatic for at least a week before they return to sports activities. And again, get return to play in 20 minutes if they're really not a that, And that kind of used to be the case, but now with all the exposure and the media and how severe these head injuries are, people aren't doing that anymore. Impact testing uh, is a way to evaluate patients' cognitive and memory function. Uh, it's a computer test that's kind of big you can take. The key is you have to do a baseline. Like for example, say you have a football team. Every football team takes one before the season starts. That way, if you suffer, if you suffer an injury, traumatic brain injury, and you take the test after you have your injury, you have a baseline compared to. I mean, you may not be, you might be a big stud, but not the smartest guy on the block. You're going to compare it to. Like, oh gosh, this guy's an awful brain injury. Have something compared to have a baseline study. One of my buddies, he played in the NFL for 12 years, and he said it's kind of funny. Like everybody's like, he's like, all the players when they did their initial, they kind of dumb up <laughs> their first, their baseline each season that way. If they had a concussion, and do it later to let them play. Which is not regularly done. It measures attention span, working memory, sustained and select working time, response variability, nonverbal problem solving, re reaction time, kind of stuff. So these are kind of some things that the testing goes over. It's very cool. You know, there's only like one or two docs that are impact certified here, here in our state. It's really kind of a really kind of cool specialty. I mean, I really think I think if you marketed a, a traumatic brain injury <coughs> specialty thing, I think you could I mean you could get a lot of cash paying people that would cover a lot of this a lot of stuff isn't going to be covered and all this stuff with insurance and stuff. But I think it's a niche that's that's needed to provide good care for people because it's it's tough sometimes you get these patients that have these really, really kind of bad concussions and, and no findings sometimes with CT, sometimes with MRI, they go on the months and sometimes they sometimes really struggle. Uh, so sometimes it's kind of tough. So it, it, it really needs, I think it's a niche for an area that medicine needs to become expanded more. These organizations using the impact system, NFL, really baseball, soccer, NBA, hockey, military. Um, so these are ballistic helmets, so obviously the amount of blast and force that gets exerted from these IEDs and explosions is tremendous. And so they have these little <coughs> sensors they can put in their helmets to determine how much force and these. These soldiers have experienced. Pretty cool. Focal lesions, epidural, okay, occurs in 0 5% of all head injuries, <coughs> blunt trauma to the temporal parietal area, okay, 80% associated with a skull fracture. Skull fracture occurs where? What bone? Temporal, temporal bone. And what vessel is injured there? Middle of the artery. That's a, that's a, that's a board question, okay. Middle meningeal artery, temporal bone fracture, epidural, hematoma. Okay? It's lenticular, kind of football shape. Pretty easy to see, right? Look at the CT scan. Would you say that the, if there's any midline shift? Are the ventricles effaced? Maybe a little bit of effacement on, 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 on the right side. So, Is this the right side? Would you call this a right or a left epidural? The right. Okay. It's like they're standing on your feet looking at you. You may how many people don't get the side concept things. Okay. Alright? So this is a pretty good size epidural, right? It's a midline shift and the ventricles pretty much are faced on the right side, correct? So anytime you're talking to a specialist on the phone, whether it's a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, Know how to describe what you're seeing, okay? 
even if you got to pull out your little book and look at it before you talk to them, don't sound like a bum in it, okay? Know what you're talking about. There's nothing wrong with this stuff up, but before you present a patient to somebody, if you're not sure how to describe it, look it up a little bit before you get on the phone. You need to get in the habit of learning how to describe fracture, proximal, distal, angulated, non-angulated, displaced, non-displaced, okay? Um, Focal lesions, subdural, okay? Sudden acceleration, deacceleration injuries, okay? And this is tearing of veins, okay? So a subdural is a venous tearing problem, an epidural is an arterial, right? You got the distinction? Okay. See them a lot, elderly and alcoholics, these people fall little subdurals all the time. They can be acute, subacute, or chronic. Acute's less than two weeks, chronic's less than two weeks. One time we had this neurosurgeon. I had this patient there with a GCS of nine, and they had huge dilated ventricles. And so, a condition that we that we occurred with dilated ventricles is what hydrocephalus, right? Okay, so increased pressure and swelling the brain. She said, Brad. She's like, well, sometimes people brain injury get they call it an ex vacuo effect. No, you don't need to know. It's called an ex vacuo <coughs> effect, where, where your ventricles are dilated secondary to brain injury. She said, Brad, I want you to do a the neurosurgeon's on me. I want you to do a, you know, a spinal tap with this patient, take off about 40 cc's of CSF, and you know, see if their mental status improves. It does, we'll do a shunt. You know? I'm just like, that's off. I'll do it with a hernia. You know what I mean? You're a neurosurgeon. You, you can take care of it. They're killing me. Okay? The acute subdural. Pretty easy to see. As, as time goes on, the density changes in bad news subdural. Okay? The density changes. This is kind of the difference in the density here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. It goes on. So somebody, you know, somebody comes in, you know, grandma, grandma comes in and she fell today, and, you know, she hit her head, and you get that cat scan, you think that's an acute hemorrhage? No. Okay. See, it gets more dark as time goes on. Sometimes, another term you don't need to know, but sometimes they'll call that chronic subdural hygroma. H Y G R O M A. You don't need to know that. You hear the term hygroma, chronic subdural. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Most common CT finding with moderate severe traumatic brain injuries. But isolated injury may, may present with a headache, photophobia, or meningismus. Okay. Anytime you document somebody with a headache, okay, whether it's traumatic or not traumatic, you need to document photophobia, meningismus, okay. When you talk about headaches, okay, here's my little spill of headaches, okay. Where is the headache located at? What is the type of pain? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it throbbing? Big thing you want to know is sudden or gradual onset, okay. Sudden onset of headache, worry about subretinal hemorrhage, correct, right? okay. And then any any aggravating alleviating factors, okay. Better with dark room, better with quiet, worse with darker lights, Dr. all stuff. Dizziness, nausea, vomiting. Okay? So anytime you get a headache, you need to go through all those pertinent and positive and negatives. Does that make sense? Okay? Early traumatic surrounding hemorrhage develop triples mortality. Okay? So kind of dispersed amongst the gyrites, a little bit of what we call subretinal hemorrhage. Do I see the blood? Can you point it out? You're good. Okay. Sometimes you'll see on CAT scans, you get a bruise on your arm from something, you get a bruise in your brain, lots of times they'll call it a cerebral contusion or an intraparenchymal contusion. Okay, kind of same thing though. Herniation, There's, there will probably be some hernia, herniation question on your boards. If you sex on injury we talked about, oftentimes you'll see in patients that have a hypoxic <coughs> or anoxic, means low oxygenated kind of brain injury, okay? Um, and lots of times these shaken baby syndrome is if you have some injuries, it kind of shears. And you have persistent vegetative state. So again, a normal CT scan. Oftentimes, later sometimes you'll see findings on CT scans, but typically the MRI will refine uh, the findings. <coughs> Kind of diffuse, kind of white. Like, MRI's are tough. MRI's tough to read. It's diffuse, kind of, just kind of white stuff here. All the white ones here is diffuse, like all the here. So, 
And we're talking about now how do we manage these patients. Obviously, we're not talking about these concussion patients. We're talking about these patients with a severe traumatic brain injury, these brain, these brain hemorrhage, these brain bleeds, or these people who obviously have an altered mental status. Okay, the more severely injured patients. In okay? fact. Again, where do you take them to? I'm going to take them to a place that has neurosurgery, okay? <coughs> have a CT scanner, have an operating room. So CT or not CT? So, you know, a lot of this is just dull, you know? On your, on your, on yourself, you CAT scan or not CAT scan. There's lots of things to kind of take into consideration. You know, if they didn't lose consciousness, and they're not confused, and they have a reliable family, this is kind of some of the minor ones we're talking about, not to CT. So, you know, if they're alert, they're awake, they're not confused, they have a vehicle, they have reliable transportation, okay? They have the knowledge and the wits to understand if things get worse to come back, okay? Sometimes we experience encounters with patients that don't know which is left and which is right on a, on a good day, okay? So you have to, sometimes when you make a, the decision to send people home, the return of symptoms are worse, and if they don't have a ride or availability, okay, or the or the, the neurological ability to determine something's worse to get back. Those are people you don't send home, at least that little study. Okay? Again we talk about intoxication or you know other things. So sometimes these people have a very minor head injury but they're under the influence of alcohol, they're alert, they're awake, they're talking to you, they don't seem too confused if they're under the influence of alcohol in a casket. Okay? Before I send home. Or poor follow up, I don't have a doctor. Okay? So people who have, who have no follow up or Kind of some social situations, you know. Sometimes, sometimes we end up kind of doing things differently if they have a social situation. I had this guy one time that his wife was on hospice. He was up six steps. He had a fractured dislocation of his ankle, and the orthopedic surgeon on that day was a turd. And he's like, "It's like a Friday. Send him home. Have him be at the hospital at five o'clock for surgery." This guy can't walk crutches and up the steps, and his wife's on hospice. It's just like, you know, it's a social situation. So oftentimes we have to sometimes admit people and do things for social reasons, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. You have to take care of people. Um, don't have MD calc on your phones. If you don't, you need to get it, okay? Um, in the last, you know, I don't know, last six, seven years or so, we're really trying to not cat scan people if you don't have to. Uh, these are rules you can evaluate for, to evaluate whether you need a cat scan or do not cat scan a patient based on these symptoms. Canadian head CT was kind of the, it's kind of the oldest one. It's kind of one for adults. PCARN is the most commonly one used for kids. Um, there's a kind of a map for less than two and a map for greater than two. Uh, the newer one is a pediatric nexus two head CT decision for more trauma um, for kids less than 18 years old and 24 hours of those symptoms. Um, y'all want to go through one on? Y'all want to go, go through MD calc to show you what they look like in MD calc, or you guys got on your own? <coughs> Yeah, and here's the PCARN. So A is less than two years old. Let's see. So GCS of 14, or other signs of altered mental status or palpable skull fracture. Okay, if they have that, they get a CAT scan. If they don't, you go to the next question. They have parietal or occipital or temporal scalp hematoma. Previously okay. lost consciousness during five seconds when you're back in the injury. You know the CT is not recommended, and, and if you have to get a CT scan. Um, you know, when I tell people, you know, these kids, are looking, you know, so frontal scalp hematomas are not that big a deal. That's the most common thing that these kids come in with. These little, these little kids, they fall and they hit their head. Yesterday, my little five-year-old is pushing my twins or two, doing circles and 180s on the stroller in my driveway. Of course, fall out and broke with their head. It's just like, frontal scalp stuff is not that big a deal to, to deal with, okay? They have these scalp hematomas. You get more, you get more concerned for in the temporal or kind of occipital area, okay? That makes sense? But you're going to have these patients that they're going to come in, and, and, and I, you know, lots of times I put it, I kind of put the onus on them. I was like, look, your kid is acting normal, they're not vomiting, you're telling me, for you, they're at their baseline, they're normal, acting great, they haven't vomited, they're not, they don't look like they're an extremist. I'm okay not cat scanning their head. You know, you look like a reliable patient, you have a ride, you have a vehicle, you, you know, if you, if you see these symptoms, return. But I, I come sometimes up on the patients. It's like, look, if you're just like, hey, you know, I want a CAT scan, I'll do one. But then I'm talking about the risk. The risk of radiation, lifetime risk of cancers, pediatric cancers. Okay? So you kind of put you kind of put on them, okay? 
And so you just have to be, I think, real careful when you are not CAT scanning people, if you're sending them home and not doing a CAT scan, to document that you're going through these rules. Or, okay, because if you document, you know, these protocols you're going through, you documented and evaluated why you sent them home. And that's on solid medicine, okay? If you don't document a good understanding for what your thought process was in your, in your, in your logical process through the time to not CAT scan the kid, they go home about a bad outcome and end up having a blame bleed, you know? So if you go through these protocols, it's kind of standard of care. They're really trying to not CAT scan. If you need a CAT scan, you get one, okay? If you have any concern, if you have any confusion, you get it. But if these kids that are coming in that are, that are acting perfectly normal with a minor head injury, you just need to give families precautions. Okay? But again, if you have if you have this assault, you're concerned about the kid, you're worried about acting right, scan them. It's no big deal. Lots of patients get sometimes get, you know, had an MRI before, I can't get a CAT scan. MRI is obviously your claustrophobic thing with tube or nowhere. So these they have open MRIs now, but CT scans are not confined, especially if it's a head. Only thing is in your head. Okay? Sometimes you have to kind of calm patients down and get a little bit out of man relax too. Okay? Because when you get these CAT scans, it's like a camera. If you have a camera that's moving, your picture is blurry. It's the same thing. They're moving, they're getting these CAT scans, it's a crappy picture, crappy images. Sometimes you have to repeat studies. So disposition. Obviously, if you have a patient okay, who's had a normal CAT scan and they're still confused, okay, they don't clear up, this patient sometimes has to be admitted and observed. Okay? Let's say you're in Godivo and you don't have a CAT scanner. You know, the guy looks okay. You know, sometimes you admit those people, but realistically, if, if you're concerned enough about them being confused, you're going to transfer them somewhere that has a CT scan, okay? So you admit them, obviously, to have an abnormal CT scan or fluctuating <coughs> loss of consciousness of your headache. If they're intoxicated, you have to admit these people. These intoxicated head injury patients, so you have to admit them and observe them and kind of listen to Mexico when they wake up and they're drunk and you get a good neurological exam on them, okay? Mm -hmm. pretty, pretty easy to see that a little of GCS increase your risk of mortality. Or GCS, more severe brain injury. So what can we do for people that have these severe brain injuries, these brain bleeds? We can maintain their blood pressure, or maintain good mean arterial pressure, cerebral blood, blood flow, okay? Oxygenate them, prevent hy hypoxia. IV fluids are important. You want to kind of keep them eubulemic. You don't want to give them too much. You don't want to load them with fluids. You don't want to get them dehydrated either. Hyperventilation is a thing that was really kind of big back in the day that really backed off the hyperventilation thing. Um, you want to keep your CO2 from 25 to 35. Patient positioning, you can elevate the head of the bed and decrease intracranial pressure. Okay? You can sit somebody who's sedated. Is, is, you know, if they have a high insane, if they have a bad brain bleed and you have a, a, you have a, a drain, a pressure your drain because their ICPs are so high, you have to put a drain in to leave the pressure or leave the swelling. Oftentimes, they get agitated from a brain injury. Okay, they get mad, they get irritated, they're thrashing around, their ICPs go up, so oftentimes sedating them help decrease intracranial pressure. Mannitol is, is a kind of a diuretic that's used to decrease intracranial pressure. We need to use like someone use more steroids. There's zero, zero indication for, so if this is a, a take, right, if they're going to write something down, don't write down. There's <coughs> never an indication for steroids in a traumatic brain injury. Never. Okay? Steroids are used for spinal cord injuries, okay, that are associated with blunt trauma. Spinal, steroids are not indicated in penetrating spinal cord trauma, okay? There's all these data, you know, kind of just getting off the, jump off of the tracker a little bit. You know, spinal cord injuries, if a patient comes up with spinal cord injuries, there's 50% of this data that say the steroids don't help spinal cord injuries. There's 50% of the data that says it helps. And so everybody is stuck in this, in this litigious thing of if you have a patient with spinal cord injury, you're giving steroids because you don't want to get sued, you know? It's crazy, so, and you've had these, these things that have been proven over time where this, this doctor got sued for this thing and now it's proved to be false that he really didn't mess up and he doesn't give his money back, he doesn't give his suit back. It's crazy. But there is an international problem where people with spinal cord injuries, with blood spinal cord injuries, are still giving steroids even though there's really no benefit to prove that health. Uh, but there's zero indication for steroids in brain injuries. Okay? We give seizure medications. All these people with brain injuries, okay, they have high likelihood of developing seizures. Okay? The neuromuscular blockade that paralyzes people. Okay. There was a, uh, a really cool lecture from Pennsylvania. This 14-year-old kid came into ER. He was seizing. They hit. They threw. They threw the whole pharmacy at this kid. Okay. Lots of times, use Ativan for acute seizures. Okay. To help decrease seizures. 
Ativan didn't help. They loaded them with Cerebrex. Cerebrex is an older medication we love. Phosphatidylamine, we load the procedures. They loaded them with Keppra. They start throwing just, just asinine doses of medications at this kid to try to get him to stop seizing. He's in, he's in, seizure, he's in status of levels. Okay? Just seizing and seizing and seizing. They finally put him in a femur coma to get this kid to stop seizing. And after they did a physical exam on this guy, after they you know, get through this 40 minutes of seizing with this kid, he had a puncture on his foot. So he was Amish. He didn't believe in vaccinations. He walks around and he had tetanus. This is just a zebra. I mean, of all things, he had a zebra. And got a wound puncture on his foot. He got tetanus. See, it's crazy. Let's talk about patient positioning. Elevate the head of the bed. Eulemia is great. Um, here's, a, here's probably a board question. So if you have a patient with traumatic brain injury, you never want to give dextrose containing IV fluids. Why? Because it crosses the blood brain barrier and causes swelling. So no dextrose containing IV fluids in a patient with a traumatic brain injury. Okay? A brain injury. Okay? Common things that happen uh, in, in traumatic brain injury patients is they get hyponatremic. And they get hyponatremic secondary to two conditions. I should have put them in there. Uh, again, SIDH syndrome, an inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, and cerebral salt lesson. Okay? So you have a traumatic brain injury patient okay, that has hyponatremia. You worry about SIDH or cerebral salt lesson syndrome. Um, there's a medicine you give called Desmopressin, also known as DDAVP. It's a medicine you give kids for wetting the bed. It helps with that. Uh, and then sometimes you get these patients, these brain injury patients, they, because they have this syndrome, they want to drink. They want to drink water, drink water, drink water, drink water. We had this guy, you know, we had to, you have to limit their free water intake. I had this guy, he was, he was stealing crap out of people's rooms. He was really, really impulsive. He was stealing crap out of people's rooms. And, he got to the point where he had to cut his water off his drink and kept drinking a ton of water and the sodium dropped even lower. And he we caught him drinking out of the toilet. Oh. So modern INOs, Foley catheter again, Molly evaluating INOs. Manitoba talked about these patients that have intracranial swelling. Blakesis and mantle can be used together for diuresis, decrease intracranial pressure. Hyperventilation we talked about, normal cap is preferred. You want to keep their CO2 25 to 30. Barbiturates, phenobarb coma, okay? Something you can use to help decrease the paralyze, help the paralyzing and calm them down to help decrease intracranial pressure. And then CSF reduction. So if you ever hear the term a bolt or an EBD, extracurricular drain, okay? The term a bolt was just kind of a pressure monitor, but really it's all kind of included. It's an extracurricular drain and a pressure monitor. What they'll do is they'll come into the ED. It's really cool. I've done a couple of the neurosurgeons down there. They'll just crank the drill, a little hand drill in the ED. You come in, they put a, a catheter down in your ventricles and help relieve pressure. So it gives you the pressures inside the brain. It also helps relieve fluid. Okay? Look like a unicorn. We talk about seizure medications. Keppra is kind of the, new, the newer anti-seizure medication. It's, it's oral and IV. Before it was, was phosphenitoin, also known as Cerebrex. Okay. So, Dilantin, one of the older seizure medications is Dilantin, also known as Phenitoin. The IV form is phosphenitoin, also known as Cerebrex. So, you, you know, lots, often people have insurance throwing Dilantin because it's so cheap and it's really common, very easy to get. Um, a neurologist she kind of showed me one time a really cool thing. Sometimes you these people that come in and they're sub-therapeutic on their, on their ranges, on their doses. So Dilantin is a medicine that has to be monitored. Um, so a therapeutic blood range is 10 to 20. So let's say they're taking some of their medications and their, and their range is 5 instead of 10 to 20. So it's a little low and they have a seizure. <coughs> when, you, when you load a patient with, who who's, has no Dilantin on drawer, you give them 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram of of cerebrex. So one thing is kind of point these people are kind of not zero because they're in the middle. You can kind of take a difference of your goal. Say they're, say say you want to shoot say you want to shoot for 20 and they were five, you can take the difference to 25 and load it to 15 per kilo. It's kind of people trick that we're all showing the time. But honestly, cerebrex is not used as much frequently because you know in the ED lost center a little Kepra. Almost every ER is Kepra. But that land is a good choice. But you have to monitor <coughs> um, 
When people are acutely having seizures, Ativan is a drug of choice. People get Valium all the time, but Ativan works so much better for trying to, to cease an acute active seizure. Um, in EMS a couple years ago, they approved IM Versed for these people having severe intractable seizures. But it really kind of stinks. Sometimes you get so many small areas that have paramedics that are just basics. They can't do IVs, can't do IV medications, and they get a patient seizing their ambulance. They're 20 minutes to the next town and they can't do this patient anything. They're just driving, hoping to stop seizing. That's kind of scary. Muscle relaxants are the last rule. They'll decrease the cranial pressure. Steroids, we talked about, are recommended. Scenario so one. 24 year old male, status post motorcycle crash. Golly, we're almost done. I'm sorry. You got five more minutes? Mm -hmm. Run these real quick. 24 year old male, status post motorcycle crash, uh, involved in a high speed accident, was not wearing a helmet. The patient's a decreased level of consciousness. EMS reports mm -hmm. the patient opened his eyes with painful stimuli, moaning, that he localizes to pain. He has obvious head and facial and extremity trauma. Before his vitals are stable. So he's a GCS at 9, so obviously he needs to be intubated. Okay? Really no significant history. His right pupil is dilated, 5 millimeters and fixed, with bilateral parable hematoma, mild epistaxis, we've got a hematoma on, obviously got rhinorrhea. Okay? So, did y'all get RSI? RSI is a whole lecture in itself. Did y'all get a lecture on RSI, <laughs> rapid sequence intubation? Okay. Uh, airway and that's with that. Okay. The gestalt of rapid sequence intubation is a way to systematically intubate a patient to decrease the likelihood of them. Uh, aspirated, okay? So with head injuries, one of the medications we give to help decrease intracranial pressure is lidocaine. That's the whole gist. We'll need to read up about this, but lidocaine is a medication that we give, free medication to decrease intracranial swelling. So if you're going to intubate a patient, if you're going to intubate a patient with a brain bleed, you want to give them lidocaine to decrease intracranial pressure. That's a poor question, okay? Atropine you give to kids to decrease secretions. So another, those are two free medicating medications we give when we RSI patients, okay? Oh, Y'all can read this stuff, okay? Paralytics, just know the difference between short acting and long acting, okay? No, for burn patients or crush injury patients, you stay away from succinyl colon, okay? After you intubate a patient and paralyze a patient, you've got to give them medications to keep them sedated, okay? Whereas pain and sedation, unless you do the intubate a patient, the paralytics wear off and they wake up and extubate themselves, okay? Scenario two. 10-year-old kid presents the ER with his mom. She reports he fell on a skateboard. It was, she witnessed the accident. He was not wearing his helmet. The accident occurred. He wiped out doing a trick, hit the side of his head on a curb. He denies lots of consciousness. He was dazed for a couple minutes, had vomiting times one. The reports now he's much better. The only complaints a headache. The patient not appear confused at baseline talking to you. His GCS is 15, right? Pretty good negative medical history. Hematoma, contusion, right temporal region. Okay. CT scan the head of an order while awaiting the patient to be transported to CAT scan. You're called in the room by a nurse about 20 minutes later after you examine the patient and monitor course the nurse. He closes his eyes to rest and now it's difficult to arouse. The middle status is decreased. What does he have? Hit his head with pain and bruising in the temporal area. Okay. Board question. Lucid interval. Okay. Lucid interval is an area of these people that have an epidural hematoma. So oftentimes they appear great and they just crumb. Okay. So lucid intervals associated, so epidural hematoma, think about the lucid interval, middle lingual artery, temporal bone fracture, and then down the road, if you have a temporal bone fracture, you want to get an internal artery canal CT. Got it? Good? Okay. Craniotomy, you go to surgery, it's cute, big deal, okay? Okay, 7 year old male with CR with blunt head injury, rides by private car with his brother and his grandkids, uh, before he walked into a cabin. He bought a new house, he's doing the walkthrough through the old house, Okay, he got everything out, making sure. He walks in, he bumps his head into the cabinet. Got a superorbital, four centimeter laceration, alert wake, looks like a million bucks. He's laughing, joking with you. Denies taking any what? What's the important thing when I ask all the people? Blood, blood thinner. Deny taking any blood thinners, okay? Witness and document in front of his family. Denies taking blood thinners, okay? See where I'm going with it. Okay? So, here's the story. This is a real patient. He gets over to CAT scanner. Old guy, people, old people, scan their heads, okay? He gets over to CAT scanner, the CAT scanner breaks. He wants down. <laughs> this guy has a four centimeter laceration. He's laughing, he's joking. He's cutting up a plane with it, okay? And he says, I'm normal, I'm fine. His brother says he's normal. His grandkid says he's normal. What do you do? Do you send him home? Or do you transfer him to get a CAT scan? 
It's normal. He's laughing. He's joking. He's not even a blood thinner. What are you going to do? How old is he? He's like 70. I called and made arrangements to transfer him for a CAT scan. They said, hey, we saw his lack up before he sent him to church. So his lack up. I'm making transfer arrangements, signing paperwork, getting stuff copied. Family comes out and says, oh, you know, he didn't feel so good. So I walk in and now he's right people before and he throws it up. Okay? He was on platelets. He didn't tell me. I asked him. He didn't tell me. He wanted another medication. It's crazy. You don't believe me. He wanted another medication. Okay? That guy died like four hours later. Hardy had to die. Okay? And all crazy things. He bought this new house. I bought a house like a year and a half later. And his life was like me. All crazy things. Your story. So head trauma pearls. Scan all people's heads if they have any possibility of a head injury. Scan all people's possibility of a head injury. They're on aspirin, equivalent, or plavix. Okay? And some of these newer medications, okay? The thrombin inhibitors, okay? Or 10A inhibitors, okay? Zoralto, Eliquis, Cardaxa, okay? You gotta know your medicines. Every patient, every patient, the first thing, one of the things you need to look at when you walk in a room by a patient, look at all their medicines, okay? Because you need to know what could be, what something else that you need to look for, okay? Continue repeat neuro exams, okay, and people checks, and patient pet injuries, okay? It's crazy that people, the people that examine, people document, they don't do. Okay, you have people that are found down <coughs> for two days and they document your ear clear and they get the ICD and maggots crawling out of their ears. They don't be looking at their ears, okay? Reassess your patients, reassess people stuff. The last thing you want to do if you ever have a patient who's crumpy and has an ultra mental status, whether you're going to send them a CAT scan or send them in an ambulance to go to another hospital, do you think there's any chance you could lose their airway there or they deteriorate, intubate the patient in a control setting under your terms? The worst thing to do is to intubate a patient in a CT scanner who's crumping or coding. Okay? It's awful. You're out of your realm. You don't have your equipment. You don't have your tools. You don't have lighting. So if you have to intubate somebody, if you're worried about somebody, if you're worried about the loser airway, don't, don't, don't try to not intubate the patient as good as, eh, if you're concerned about the airway, intubate them, okay? Know your resources, don't be afraid to ask for help on your rotations, okay? Realize when you're over your head. The only stupid question is the one you didn't ask. Amongst there's some people that ask a lot of stupid questions, too many questions, but in general, if you have a question, ask. Don't say you don't understand something if you don't. Don't lie, okay? Clinical judgment, sometimes you're gonna have these things where you think, hey, something's wrong with this patient, okay? I don't feel comfortable sending them home until you get a certain study, do it. I can tell you how many times you get home and you're like, oh, I wish I'd cast scan that patient. Or I wish I'd done that. Okay? You're going to be wrong sometimes. You're going to pick up some things. Your gut's going to pick up some things. Okay? C spines. Assume these people have vascular injuries. And this lady one time, rollover meth man, injected, positive for everything I give her the next day. She's a CT and L spine precaution. Her x rays were read normal by the radiologist the next day. She had this pain out of proportion on her neck. Her teeth her and L spines were fine. We did a CAT scan. She had a first facet at C4, C5 vertebral foramen fracture at C2 and C3, and she had a, a dissection of her vertebral artery. Mm -hmm. And even going back and looking on the plain films, you couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. So physical exam, pain out of proportion exam, okay, is important. Um, I, want, I want you guys to read these things, these clotting cascade things. One of the big, big, big things out right now, it, it, it could be a whole other lecture on reversal of anticoagulation, okay. Treatment of DGTs, of deep vein thrombosis, okay. We can also treat uh, AFib or with these newer medications like Xeralto and Aliquis. So the two most common 10A inhibitors that are used. They're great because you don't have to monitor them, okay? Coumadin is rat poison, also known as warfarin. It's the, it's the drug that we used to use to put people on with AFib with blood clots. We treat them all the time. The downfall is if certain medications you can take can alter, leafy vegetable can alter your Coumadin level. The INR, with the, the goal for a clot is between 2 and 3. The higher the number, the thinner your blood. So. When you when you, somebody has an acute blood clot, you have to give them injections of low molecular weight, low blood oxygen, thin their blood immediately. Then you have to put them on the pails of warfarin, and they have to alter and find a dose. Sometimes it takes you know a couple of weeks getting your dose right to keep your NR between two and three. You have to get lab draws. It's a huge pain in the ass. Okay. The newer medications are also result and and Elpis and Pradaxa. You don't have to monitor them. They're they're okay. You take the pill and you're done. It has a two to three hour. FOC, so you're fully implanted in two or three hours after taking them on average, okay? So you're not doing these bridging and, and other things. The negative aspect of them is there's really not a reversal agent for all of them out yet. For DAXA has a, has a reversal agent, um, but it's, oh, a lot of people are using it. You know, Pradaxa says, hey, it's dialysizable, so somebody has an elevator, but who's going to put dialysis catheter in a patient who's <laughs> coagulated? It's kind of crazy. Um, so 
there's more there's more things coming down the pipe, okay, for reversal agents for eloquence and Xarelto. So if somebody somebody comes in and has a head bleed and they're on Coumadin or Warfarin, okay. In the past, we give vitamin K and, and, and fresh frozen plasma. That's how we reverse the clotting cascade, okay. Pretty easy, pretty simple. K Centra is a new four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate. Is used in addition now instead of FFP. And vitamin K to treat warfarin uh, uh, patients who are, who are anticoagulated with brain bleeds. For the other ones, there really is a four factor. There's a three and a four factor uh, complex concentrate. So really, all there is right now for the other for the other ones for Zeralto and the Elkos is the four factor. But these are these are really cool. To read through these. You need, you need to you need to know these last couple of slides again. This could be a lecture all in itself. I got I found a really good slide presentation from someone else, and I acknowledge who they probably came from, but for the treatment, you really need to know this. Look at the dosing interval, the onset, and the half-life, okay? So, Plavix is a medication that's given by cardiologists a lot of times for people that have strokes and have coronary stents. Plavix has a 36-hour half-life, okay? There's nothing to do but to hope and pray. That's what that guy that died in the butt, okay? Cardiologists like it to keep the stents open, and they don't have to monitor it, kind of stuff. So these are some good slides. Y'all got y'all need to read up and know about this because when you're in ear rotation, you're gonna get somebody old that has a head bleed that's anticoagulated, and you're gonna know how to treat them. Okay? So there's a good little slide that y'all can read. But again, this this could be a whole slide, this could be a whole lecture in itself. Okay? This is this is the Prax bind is, is the one reversal that's available for for Pradaxo. Pradaxo is one of the first ones, and they got hammered by the FDA and fined like millions of dollars for <laughs> For some of their marketing and how they promoted the drugs, saying some crazy things. So, anyway, any questions?